Number 1. Erica was last seen by 9 o'clock and 10 p.m. at the Video N. Tan in Brooksville, Kentucky on October 21, 1997. She was socializing with her friends that night. She has never been heard from again. Erica's black four-door 1988 Pontiac Bonneville SSE was discovered unlocked and abandoned off of Franck Road between bales of hay in a field off Franck's Lane the day after her disappearance. The vehicle was located approximately one mile from the video and tan. Her purse, wallet, checkbook and money were inside the car, but there was no sign of her at the scene. Erica's car keys were missing for some time afterwards, but were later discovered across the road under some leaves. There was no sign of Erica near the car, nor were there any signs of foul play. A photo of the vehicle is posted with this case summary. A man who was questioned about Erica's disappearance later shot his wife to death before committing suicide. Authorities say the individual was ruled out as a suspect in Erica's case before he died. He had an alibi for the night of her disappearance. Another suspect, 20-year-old Shane M. Simcox, an acquaintance of Erica's, was with Erica the night she vanished and may have been the last person to see her. He stated she gave him a ride to his house, dropping him off at 9 p.m. Simcox had previously been expelled from Bracken County High School for threatening a teacher and her daughter. He has a criminal record for burglary, and he refused to take a lie detector test in connection with Erica's case, but he has maintained his innocence in her disappearance, and no convincing evidence has been found against him. He is, however, considered a person of interest in Erica's disappearance. Erica was a resident of Germantown, Kentucky, 50 miles south of Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1997. She was a senior at Bracken County High School in 1997 and worked part-time at Carota's Pizza in Augusta. Shortly before she went missing, she requested more hours at her job. She planned to enroll in Northern Kentucky University after graduation and study accounting. Although she'd started hanging out with a rough crowd and she had argued with her best friend prior to her disappearance, authorities do not believe Erica left of her own accord. She has no history of running away, she was a good student with a steady boyfriend and no indications of trouble in her life and she didn't tell her friends of any travel plans. There are few leads in Erica's case. Her parents have both died in the years since her disappearance. Due to lack evidence as to her fate, her disappearance is being investigated as a missing person rather than a crime. Number 2. Police and volunteers continue to search for a Knott County woman who went missing May 7. Her family still hopes she will return. However, they fear for her safety. Natasha Fugate Jones resides at 153 Singleton Branch with her grandmother Ola Chaffins, Ola's husband Ed Grigsby, and Jones' two sons, Connor, 8, and Hunter, 11. Chaffin said May 7 started out like any ordinary day. She had a doctor's appointment that morning in Hazard and wasn't there very long. When I returned home Natasha was gone, recalled Chaffin's. That was nothing unusual for her to go with a friend to the doctor or hit the woods or go for a walk. It started getting dark. I told the boys to get ready for bed. When I went to check on them, I saw Hunter reading a note that his mom wrote to the boys. She told them she would be gone for two to three days and to not be sad. She would be back. I didn't want to show the boys I was worried. I asked Hunter if he had heard from her. He said no. Chaffin said her granddaughter's note also said she was looking for a place where the three of them could be together. The children had been staying with their grandmother. The grandmother said, that Jones was supposed to be in a rehab center in Harlan and she walked off. Naturally she was not supposed to be here, but I was not going to put her out in the cold. She stayed in lot hair for two to three years, but she stayed in contact with her boys. She loves her boys. Somebody always knew where she was. She has never been gone like this, and no one knows where she is. Social media has not been good for the children, said Chaffins. In a way Facebook is good but not always. Poor Hunter read all the things on Facebook and he got fed up and responded, telling others, don't say my mom is dead. It has been six weeks since Jones has last been seen, but it wasn't reported to police until June 7. Kentucky State Police Post 13 opened an investigation and missing persons case. 
friends and neighbors have been great support for the family. Chaffin stated, our neighbors have been looking up there when they heard about it. Rescue and police are searching every day. They had dogs on the Hull Hylton strip job Saturday. Ed Grigsby, Chaffin's husband, said they keep looking on an old stripped out mine site above their house. Grigsby noted different roads lead to the large area. The area can be entered from where they live on Clear Creek and Lots Creek, Lower Mill Creek, and even Irishman Creek. The couple believe that is the last place someone has said they had seen her. Chaffins pleads to the public, we want her brought home. We are looking for her any way in the world. We want to know where she is. Her boys love her and want her home. I want her home. Everybody wants her home. Chaffins said they have a $2,000 cash reward for information. That leads to Natasha Louise Fugate Jones. If anyone has any information, contact Chaffins at 2512939 or 2233881, or the Kentucky State Police in Hazard at 4356069. Jones is described as 5 feet 9 inches, 130 pounds, green eyes, and Caucasian. She has an outline of a butterfly on her back and a tattoo of flowers on a vine on her lower back. Number 3. Gamas was last seen by his family in the 400 block of Cambridge Station Way in Louisville, Kentucky on December 27, 2017. He was last seen in the company of a female friend, Teresa McCoy. They were planning to go look at a house that evening. Gamas has never been heard from again. At 7 p.m. on December 27, the pair's rented black Yukon SUV, which Gamas had been driving, was found in the parking lot of Bessler's Auto Parts on Strawberry Lane. McCoy's body was inside it, with the seat belt still on. She had been shot to death and was determined to be a homicide victim. There was no sign of Gamma's. In December 2019, Larry Saar was charged with two counts of murder in McCoy's death and Gamma's presumed death. Investigators believe he killed both of them at his home on Ottawa Avenue, dumped McCoy's body where it was later found, and took Gamas's body to an unknown location. Police found half a pound of methamphetamine and some drug paraphernalia at Sar's home when they arrested him. He is awaiting trial. It's uncharacteristic of Gamas to be out of touch with his family, including his two sons. His body has not been found, but foul play is suspected in his case due to the circumstances involved. Number 4. Gorley was last seen at a friend's home Knob Lick Road in Stanford, Kentucky on May 17, 2015. His friends stated he left on foot between 8.30 and 9 p.m., walking towards Junction City about two miles away. However, when Gorley's mother called the house at 11 p.m., the homeowner told her Gorley was still there. When Gorley didn't arrive home that night or the next morning, his mother and sister went to the house to look for him. They found his shoes and hat on the porch, but no other sign of him. He has never been heard from again. It was then that Gorley's friends told his mother he had left between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. His mother doesn't believe he would have gone anywhere without his shoes. Curiously, Gorley and Linda Price disappeared within a few weeks of each other, and they were both part of the same group of friends. Neither of them has ever been located, and it's unclear if their disappearances are connected. Gorley's family believes he was murdered by people he knew and trusted, and they think they know who did it, and police also believe foul play was involved in his case, but no suspects have been named in his disappearance. His mother describes him as a hard worker and a dedicated father. His case remains unsolved. Number 5. Anne was last seen in her hometown of Louisville, Kentucky on June 1, 1983. She was riding her red, and white bicycle from the Bashford Manor Mall back to her family's residence between 5.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. Her bicycle was later found propped up against a brick pillar outside of Bacon's department store in the mall. A photo of the bicycle is posted with this case summary. Anne never arrived home and has not been heard from again. The mall was across the street from her Gerald Court home. Three days after Anne's disappearance, a police bloodhound picked up her scent around a ditch near the mall and twice led investigators to the window of an apartment across the street. It was the residence of Esther Akmiansky, the grandmother of Anne's best friend, Tanya Akmiansky.
Tanya was the last person to see Anne before she vanished. Esther said Anne had never visited her apartment. Officials eventually concluded that the dog erred when distracted by the smell of cooking food. The entire family was checked and all were cleared of involvement. There was speculation that Anne ran because she was having trouble adjusting to life in America. Her loved ones say she was not unusually anxious and, if she had decided to run away, she would probably have contacted them eventually or taken money in her favorite possessions. There were several reported sightings of her, particularly in the Brighton Beach neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York, which has a high concentration of Russian immigrants. None of the sightings were ever substantiated, however. A theory that Anne was kidnapped by agents of the Soviet government in an attempt to force her family to return to that country has been discarded. In December 2008, authorities announced they believed Gregory Lewis Oakley Jr. was responsible for Anne's abduction and murder. A photograph of Oakley is posted with this case summary. He had once abducted his stepdaughter and injected her with a painkiller drug to sedate her. He was charged with attempted murder in that case, but eventually pleaded guilty to assault. In September 1983, Oakley attacked a police officer's 13-year-old daughter in her home, stabbed her and attempted to rape her. She survived. Oakley was arrested for the crime in January 1984 and was then questioned about Anne's case. He denied involvement, but he failed a polygraph test and bank records proved he made an ATM transaction at the Bashford Manor Mall just 100 minutes before Anne disappeared. Oakley stated he left Louisville on a business trip immediately after he finished at the bank. In June 1984, Oakley was convicted of burglary and attempted rape and sentenced to 30 years in prison. He was paroled on medical grounds in 2002 returned to his native Alabama and died of lung cancer months later. In September 2008, an inmate who had served time in prison with Oakley told authorities Oakley had killed Dan with an injection of the painkiller Talwin. He was a veterinarian and would have had easy access to the drug. The informant passed a polygraph about his information and Oakley's former girlfriend corroborated the story. She stated that at 11 p.m. on the night Anne disappeared, Oakley came to her Louisville home and asked her to wash some clothes for him. This contradicts his story that he left Louisville that afternoon before Anne disappeared. Investigators stated if Oakley was alive today, based on the evidence now available, he would be charged with Anne's murder. The investigation into Anne's case remains active and authorities hope they can find her body. Her parents still live in the Louisville area and are hopeful that the case will someday be resolved. Number six. Katie was last seen on November 29, 2004 in West Paducah, Kentucky. She was in a Chevrolet S10 Blazer SUV with her parents, Johnny and Sandy Gray. Johnny, a mechanic, was test driving the SUV to check repairs. He stated he often took Katie on long drives to help her fall asleep. The Grays stated that the SUV was swamped when the family tried to cross Massac Creek near Mayfield Metropolis Road at approximately 12.15 a.m. on November 29th. Sandy was able to get out of the water safely, but she dropped Katie's car seat. Johnny took the car seat, and while he was attempting to get to dry land, he lost his grip on the seat and Katie was swept away. Johnny and Sandy searched for their daughter without success before walking to the a friend's house a mile and a half away to report the incident to authorities. The Grays called police about an hour after Katie disappeared. Extensive searches of the creek turned up Katie's diaper bag and bottle, but no sign of the baby or her car seat, although cadaver-smelling dogs indicated the presence of a body downstream from where Katie was swept away. Several days after his daughter's disappearance, Johnny took a polygraph test. That same day, investigators announced that, while they were still searching for Katie, the search was no longer concentrated on Massac Creek. They continued to conduct occasional searches of the water, however. Friends of Johnny and Sandy stated they were suspicious of the couple's story and that Katie's parents gave inconsistent accounts of the events of November 29. The case was handed to a grand jury in October 2005, nearly a year after Katie vanished, and in late October, both her parents were charged with second-degree manslaughter in the child's death. They were also charged with possession of marijuana, tampering with evidence and leaving the scene of an accident. 
The manslaughter indictment stated Johnny and Sandy either wantonly caused Katie's death or wantonly failed to take measures to prevent her death. In April 2006, Katie's parents reached a plea agreement with prosecutors. Johnny and Sandy both pleaded guilty to reckless homicide, tampering with physical evidence, possession of marijuana and leaving the scene of an accident, and Johnny also pleaded guilty to driving on a suspended license. The Greys were sentenced to five years in prison each. Katie and her parents resided in Lone Oak, Kentucky in 2004. The child has never been located.